Good day, everyone. Uh, hope you are enjoying the Hyperledger Global Forum event so far. Uh, my name is Arnab Chatterjee, and I'm going to present uh, compatibility and pitfalls of architectural patterns with blockchain use cases. So there's a poll for your information in the beside the chat window. Please feel free to share your responses over there. So let me introduce myself. Uh, I am a technical lead currently associated with R3, and I was previously associated with organizations like Bosch and NEC Corporation, where I gathered experience for the last eight years in building enterprise applications. Out of that, the last five years in designing and architecting blockchain applications. I am the co-author of multiple research papers on architecting blockchain systems in production. And I also represent India on behalf of the National Body of Standards, the Bureau of Indian Standards at ISO 3307, the Global Blockchain and DLT Standards. I'm a committee member there and I contribute towards identity and privacy standards. Of late, I have been also contributing to the Hyperledger tooling project, which is a new addition. And this project aims uh, to help the newcomers start their open source contribution towards Hyperledger projects. So uh, you can visit this URL and check it out. So this is the outline of what I will be presenting today uh, for the next 20 to 25 minutes. We will start with the rationale of this talk, uh, followed by a head first deep dive into some architectural uh, patterns. Uh, we will end this talk with an approach to architecting blockchain use cases using the evolutionary style of architecture. So before we begin, let me focus uh, let me emphasize that we will be focusing our discussion mostly on these uh, blockchain platforms that is hyperledger fabric and enterprise ethereum and enterprise ethereum encompassing the hyperledger base and quorum kind of projects so throughout the presentation i will be using eth or ethereum uh, for brevity uh, and please uh, feel free to ask any questions uh, and, and put the put the questions in the Q and A box. Right, uh, I'll I'll try to answer them towards the end of the presentation. So um, let's get started. So why this presentation? So uh, blockchain platforms has been in constant flux. Uh, bug features, feet, uh, bug fixes, features are are uh, these are constantly making their way into new blockchain uh, platform releases and. Our experience in building production grade enterprise blockchain applications is pretty vast, but when we uh, uh, when we compare it with you know building blockchain production grade applications, it it has been quite limited. I mean, like comparing it to the, to the the former. So the developer fraternity is still you know figuring things out, like uh, how how they are going to go about things. And these things, as I'm calling it, they manifest themselves as, as you know, technical constraints, right? So there are a lot of these technical constraints that make our way into it, uh, into into our design, uh, and and we have to, you have to be aware of that. So, um, uh, so what is our way out? Like, uh, how can we, you know, navigate our way through uh, with the constant flux of blockchain platforms? platforms evolving and you know uh, we have to design our application so first as i see it is awareness of these you know architectural patterns or patterns as i call it knowing the constraints more in detail and specific <clears throat> specifically what architectural patterns work and what architectural patterns don't work with blockchain platforms. So this will be basically the first part of the presentation. The second part of the presentation is, is how to be agile and, and build architectures in a such a way that you know they evolve over time to reveal the best of the, uh, best of us like and we do not get uh, uh, kind of ensnared by these pitfalls. So, so we can basically protect our application by adopting the evolutionary style of building uh, architectures with blockchain. So let's get you know, started with some of the patterns. So the first pattern that we are going to look at is the good old layered monolith architecture. So in its very basic form, it has these three layers. So it has the presentation, business, and the persistence layer. Uh, 
and the persistence layer is basically talking to your blockchain through these SDKs or libraries as we call it, right? And uh, the the it is it is worth noting that this this communication pattern between uh, this this persistence and the blockchain layer is typically synchronous in nature. That means it's it it waits until uh, the the processing is not complete. So it is it is easy uh, on time and budget, and it's it's a great fit for proof of concept implementations, and and it's good for people looking out to you not know, test out blockchain. However, it is it is not scalable immediately, and it's almost throw away most of the times if we do not design our business logic properly, if we do not decouple the business logic properly. So you need to develop some sort of abstractions on the business logic so that you want to reuse the business logic later. So this is the first pattern. The second is the event-driven architecture, or EDA for short. Right here, uh, the the uh, unlike the synchronous uh, messaging pattern, uh, here the user gets an immediate response. So uh, the user is getting acknowledgement, and then the user is uh, the the request is basically you know logged into a queue or a message broker, and which is then asynchronously processed at the back end. Right, and and finally, once the processing is complete. The user is notified of the you know completion of the request uh, through some sort of notification processor or through an email. So it, it can be either ways, right? So EDA basically comprises of an initiating event that we just saw, uh, which is get which gets registered in a message broker. One or more consumers or you know message processors uh, processes these events, and finally. The uh, uh, the processing event, the the response event, is sent back to the user. So if we just relate this uh, to 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 the uh, blockchain kind of uh, the architecture, the user request is basically the initiating event, and the contract event is the processing event, which is the response event. So blockchains indeed follow the EDA style of asynchronous communication, and that's why you know EDAs also exhibit very high degree of responsiveness due to its asynchronous nature. Another thing that ED addresses is basically the on-chain, off-chain consistency co concern that, you know, how can we ensure that the off-chain is always consistent with the on-chain state, right? So we can ensure that the state of the off-chain is only updated as per the sequence of the contract events that we are emitting. So contract events in some way represent the write-ahead log uh, that we had for databases, right? Uh, now. Talking about concurrency, uh, there's a very high degree of concurrency as well in EDA kind of an architecture. So uh, ledger emits specific events like, you know, my transaction is sent, my transaction is mined, the contract event is emitted. So with these granular events, it's very easy to concur uh, it's, it's easy to model, you know, concurrent applications. So which also in turn becomes very performant uh in nature right and and finally the events also acts as natural extensibility points additional logic can be hooked up to the events in the future that enable high degree of coupling a uh, high degree of uh, extensibility to the system right moving on to the pitfalls for eda the first is basically to decide the purpose of the contract events. So this is very important, which I'm going to discuss in the subsequent slides, but the purpose can be you know, either of the two. Either it is acting as a state change carrier or it is acting as a state change notification carrier, right? And uh, so we'll, we'll move on temporarily. So to, to capture these you know, events, ED, uh, EDA kind of requires a, some sort of event streaming logic. That means you need some say, something like a RabbitMQ or a Kafka to stream these events back to any any uh, you know good old service because not every service is completely equipped with all these you know information about contract events and whom to watch out for and all of that stuff. Uh, uh, another concern is that how you debug and monitor your application and if if anything goes wrong, how do you you know come out of that like the recovery part of it? So that those are some of the things of concern in typically in the EDS style of architecture. Now moving on to a very interesting pattern, uh, which is not an architectural pattern, that is the event sourcing pattern, which is a storage pattern, right? So event sourcing pattern advocates the storage of storing the intermediate history of events like facts, along with the current state of the system. So this way one can go back to the past state by replaying the events, right? So this sounds familiar, right? Because blockchain is a natural implementation of this, right? So transaction act as state change carriers to the blockchain. And once the transactions are executed on the smart contract, the smart contract emit this contract events, which then act as state change carriers for updating the off-chain storage. 
right? So this creates a natural event sourcing uh, kind of a pattern. So in this diagram, every actor is holding a database on their own, which which they use for trading, and uh, they they send transactions uh, to the to the ledger, and the ledger emits event after processing the uh, uh, transaction, and each actor is notified events and they update their database accordingly right without making any any additional calls to the to the uh, to the ledger so this enables off chain segregation uh, uh, and off chain state representation and and this basically creates something like a cqrs or command query responsibility segregation as we call it right so let's so so why should we be concerned about the purpose of the events that i was mentioning right so in the first case we can see that the usage is basically uh, uh basically of maintaining a simple user balance so you have an address and you have a balance of the user on the ledger right so the complete information about the state change that is the balance update through the deposit or withdraw kind of events is handled by the uh, by the events themselves so you do not need to go to the ledger to explicitly query so these are basically your fat events as we call it the second use case is basically of registering users on the system right naturally there might be more data about the users on the ledger and piggybacking all of these data as parameters on the contract event data is not basically practical so it's it's practical however to use these events as notifications to services off chain but you know in this case the slim uh, the slim events basically act as state change notifiers uh, using the fat events it, it it is actually easy to construct the off chain state because you know you don't need to go to the ledger again to query uh, but I must also say that it is also possible to to update the off-chain state uh, just by looking at these, you know, slim events. But there are certain caveats to it, right? Like you have to be very careful that you know no other party is actually updating the state of the ledger, you know, while you are going to make an explicit call. And even if it is updated, right? Some ledgers like Fabric allows us to he read the history state. But we have to be careful that you know not all ledgers uh, allow you to do this. Like for specifically for E type of ledgers, it's it's not possible here. So this basically you know doubles up. The the ledger is basically doubling up as your state change event store, right? You are you are storing the all the state changes through through these events, through these contract events, and it's it's there for all the actors, right? Uh, coupled along with their respective databases, which allows them to read data conveniently from the off chain storage, right? They do not have to go to the on chain storage. This pattern is very powerful because it allows seamless querying for each of these actors on their respective databases, and they can use their existing you know known languages like sql or or any any you know no, no sql kind of languages to query data and they do not have to go through multiple data sources like the ledger the private data collection which basically adds to your performance lag when you're querying the system right so this is also a powerful pattern some things to watch out for here is that a lot of people including me at some point of time uh, in the past uh, we confused event sourcing with the event driven architecture so event sourcing is basically a storage pattern but event driven architecture is an architectural pattern right defining the structure of the system and its components um, and, and finally, we have to be aware that these history querying capabilities that I was mentioning about, it's not there for all ledgers. It's only there for certain ledgers like Fabric. Right. OK. The next is one of my favorites, uh, which is basically the microkernel architecture. The motivation of using microkernel architecture comes from you know, the immutable and sensitive nature of smart contracts. That once smart contracts are deployed, it's challenging to make changes, and also the fact that Contracts are very expensive to build and require very hard, too much of hard work to audit and you know get things in place before they're finally deployed on the ledger. So we can apply microcontrol architecture to this uh, to the core contract here. The core contract is basically the contract with the vanilla functionality that we can say with some degree of confidence will not change over time. Right, and the part that changes are modeled as plugins over here, and these plugins ex actually extend the functionality of the vanilla contract. And then we register or deregister these contracts dynamically at runtime uh, through the smart contract registry. And the the vanilla contract can basically call these uh, plugin contracts through a proxy here. A nice example of this is like how Fabric system chain codes are designed uh, that enable pluggable transaction endorsement and validation right you can you know plug in the custom bscc or qscc kind of chain codes uh, 
some of the areas to watch out for in general is that how how these vanilla contracts are designed and deployed the ap design of these vanilla contracts are are quite challenging and can be difficult to get right at 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 first and also you know we have to be aware of these special ledger considerations like how fabric allows cross chain code calls like one can only do cross chain code calls in the same channel and and then you can uh, you know you can write using doing cross chain code channels in the, in the same channel but when when it goes to different channels you can just read when you do cross chain code calls so this is another thing to watch out for next up is service based architecture or sba or soa as we also known uh, call it a uh, service oriented architecture so service oriented architecture divides the entire application into services based on the domain right and and service oriented architectures typically have around you know 7 to 12 services that share a common persistence mechanism like a database or blockchain in this case right so uh, the the based based on this scalability and the performance needs of service oriented architecture we can basically scale up some of these services you know for for better performance load balancing and fault tolerance right so when we use service oriented architecture in blockchain then uh, in an architecture like this uh, specifically uh, concurrency issues are so for example fabric which does not allow modifying the same key in the read write set in two or more transactions in the same block right then you need to coordinate right uh, it's it's basically called the mvcc multi version concurrency control check and and again in ethereum you have these problems of nonce nonce right so ethereum on on the other hand requires these transactions from an account to be sequenced using a nonce or a number used only once and these services being kind of independent processes they fail to cater to this concurrency needs without complex coordination and this is where the central transaction orchestrator comes in right with a persistent memory or a database so the orchestrator serves multiple purposes so it first it caters to these special concurrency needs as i was telling about right like avoiding the mvcc conflicts or the nonce requirements it also removes the need for e service to know about uh, you know blockchain network specifics like you know the node information which peer should i send a transaction the sign in mechanism the contract information and all of that stuff on the other hand uh, the orchestrator also does some good job in you know planning the concurrency of the system like it can group and segregate transactions you know that are independent of each other and then they it can you know plan the transaction executions uh, uh, in in a very nice way so you can get nice nice guarantees over here so one of the worthy mentions over here is that there is a there is a, a project called firefly that was supposed to be submitted to the hyperledger labs project which which does something similar to this okay i've saved this biggie for the last microservices uh, microservices are typically one of the most hyped architectural patterns right and it is a very close relative of the uh, service oriented architecture but one of the biggest differences of 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 microservices from service oriented architecture is basically the number of services that are there right in in soas we have around 7 to 12 but in microservices it's in order of you know hundreds or maybe more right which are completely independent of each other i want to you know emphasize this fact because microservices should not typically talk to each other because then they don't make sense in scaling right uh, then basically your 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 uh, performance and all of these benefits get get subsumed by you know the the overhead of the communication now if we take this discussion right and we contextualize it to our previous discussion on soa right we can recall that the central ledger needs something like an orchestrator right to care to take care of these mvcc or the nonce issues at the very bare minimum now the moment we add the central orchestrator over here the whole point of microservice fails right because every service is now going to talk to this central orchestrator so in my opinion right uh, using microservices with blockchain is mostly an anti pattern i would say unless your microservice is completely independent and can connect to the ledger independently and and have all these logic inside their respective services otherwise i will not kind of much advocate with going with microservice architecture okay um we, we saw a lot of uh, uh, architectural patterns now what next so the next thing is that we have understood a lot about 
these architectural patterns and we have seen that you know what are the pitfalls what are the advantages what are the compatibility kind of uh, uh, things that we, we we can have uh, by looking at these patterns and it's it's an evolutionary thing right so as i was saying uh, blockchain platforms evolve and we have to continuously experiment with different architectural styles and uh, you know ensure that we are not doing harm to our system at the same time right we cannot continuously do too many changes up to our system just to figure out you know what fits and what does not so how does a newcomer uh, or a anyone who is willing to start off with a project how do they go about it right so so it at least in my experience and in my uh, you know organizational experience what i have realized is that you know building these uh, evolutionary architectures help right so the first thing that we have to figure out is that you know uh, while starting a project what are the software quality metrics or quality attributes as we call it right that are fundamental to building any system right so our objective would be to typically you know take around 3 or 5 metrics for our project and then we have to decide on these quality attributes uh, and and do a lot of brainstorming with all the stakeholders and and kind of finalize these top 3 now once we have these attributes uh, right uh, we can then plug them in into a system wide architectural fitness function right so this f big f is a function of like a1 a2 up till an where you know each of ai is basically your quality attribute right so for example let's let's say that we chose performance availability security and modularity right we can then key in each of these attributes into f right where these ai are basically your performance availability security and modularity and once we have this entire you know function uh, we can make guided experiments right uh, and and then learn about the trade offs that we have to make while we design the architecture so the process goes something like this right so we implement a a, a baseline architecture uh, that is let's say we start with a layered monolith and then we you know evaluate this f for our system right let's say it's some number uh, at, at the very bare minimum you can have you know uh, a summation of all these attributes right uh, so once we have it right then uh, you discover that what all uh, so so once once you once you implement it then you measure right what's what's the overall value of f and once you have measured then then the next stage is to uh, you know discover what are the improvements so with our experience in 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 these patterns and all we will make these uh, improvements to the architecture we will make these changes to the architecture and build an incremental architecture that is the next version of the system right um, and and this incremental version is basically what we will call uh, with a new uh, version release and once we have done it uh, we will circle back to measuring that uh, uh f value again right over number at, at over here number 2 right and if we find that the the num the the measurement that we have got after doing this incremental change is better than the previous one then we can proceed with that direction that it that that means that it will give us you know some sort of hint that we are going in the right direction because what happens typically is that once you make any changes to any architecture you're essentially doing a trade off and the moment you do a trade off you cannot exactly quantify the 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 positive or the negative impact you had on the system so to to quantify it at an overall level that's where this system wide architectural fitness function comes in so this is a very interesting concept that at least i learned um, you know in in, uh, in in my in my tenure uh, and i'm still learning over here and if you want to know more basically about how these evolutionary architectures work i recommend uh, reading uh, i recommend you to read this book by uh, neil ford and rebecca parsons on building evolutionary architectures that's a pretty interesting read so that's that's all from my side uh thank you for attending the presentation and listening patiently uh i am open for questions so let's look at the q a tab for any questions okay so 
there are no questions but uh, since i have got a little bit of time let me you know show you something uh, about you know the quality attributes right so when we start with the project uh, you know uh, i've taken this from a very interesting resource called developer to architect uh, we typically pick some of these you know uh, candidate architectural characteristics right and once once we pick them up we you know derive these top characteristics this this top 3 or 5 you know driving characteristics for our system and then once you have got this you can then you know uh, you know find out the pros and cons of each of these uh, uh, architectural patterns uh, by looking at a metric something like this right uh, of course this is not contextualized to to blockchain but of course when you look at uh, you know these patterns in general uh, it gives you a fair amount of idea that what patterns have what characteristics that they exhibit and then you can go back to some of these lessons that we learned today some of these things that we discussed today and uh, you can you know then kind of incrementally uh, build your system starting small and then you know moving on to advanced techniques as we move on okay so any questions uh, okay uh, i got a question from shonok uh, the previous slide it same for any architecture how it is different for blockchain yes that's an excellent question so this slide is is same for all uh, the architectural patterns however as i the the at the beginning of the presentation as i was seeing that some architectural patterns have certain compatibility uh, uh, with 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 blockchain and some architectural patterns have some pitfalls so it's not enough in my opinion to just know you know what works and what doesn't we also have to know the you know the these these uh, you know compatibility points or pitfalls before we proceed with some of these architectures so for example as i was telling about you know microservices architecture uh, a, a lot of a lot of the people in my organization ask that you know why don't you do uh, microservice architecture as an architect when we start with the with the project you know we are not aware of these pitfalls like we are not aware that you know we need this central kind of an orchestrator to to send all those transactions through that will coordinate all those transactions have all those concurrency issues fixed uh, you know taken care of uh, and and then you know build it right so this previous knowledge about these compatibility and pitfalls helps a lot so that's why you need to kind of couple this particular this this uh, slide this metrics along with the knowledge of these constraints and pitfalls and the compatibility as well i hope that answers the question okay there is one more question can you talk a bit about compatibility between different architecture patterns does it make sense to utilize multiple at the same time yes absolutely yes that makes perfect sense and that's an excellent question so often what uh, we do is that so for example when we design smart contracts so one of the things that we you know had a look in smart contracts is how microkernel architectures help there no matter what uh, uh, kind of architecture you have for your off chain or for your d app it always makes sense to have your you know smart contracts modular and you know reusable so you don't have to you know uh, decouple those uh, smart contracts later and and uh, you know uh, deploy new ver newer versions of them so upfront if you have the knowledge that you know i am going to use always kind of micro kernel kernel kind of an architecture for smart contracts or then you know use the central event orchestrator for for having all the transactions go through it right and and manage the concurrency aspects to it so there you have it like i have just coupled service oriented architecture and micro micro kernel architecture so yeah you can obviously uh, you know com uh, compile these patterns are there architectural pitfalls when designing with multiple blockchains hyperledger ebsi ethereum or cardano that's another excellent question so yes so in my opinion you have to be very much aware of these you know pitfalls of uh, or compatibilities of of the pattern with the ledger platform so certain certain platforms require you to design your architecture in certain way so so if you have that knowledge it will help you to you know design your components your modules 
you know with with ease i would say so 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 so, so basically when you combine uh, these uh, right probably if you have a, if you have a i don't know if that's a question if if you have a system where you have multiple ledger platforms or you have to support multiple ledger platforms then of course you have to make you know some of these trade offs and some of these decisions that you know take into account these um, specific nuances and these constraints of the platforms okay there's one more question what are the risks of event driven systems i'm often somewhat uncomfortable in case an event disappears oh that's another ex excellent question so yes i have faced this as well so um uh, what what i would suggest is that you know events typically in in blockchain are kind of ephemeral in nature unless you persist it in a, some sort of an event store like a kafka or a rabbit mq or maybe some some managed cloud offering like azure service bus it becomes difficult to deal with those events and typically when you have multiple consumers you know consuming those events so i would recommend that you use uh, 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 some sort of a uh, uh, event broker to hold your events persistently on disk and use the relevant patterns like you can have you know uh, one producer multiple consumer kind of a pattern or uh, you know you can um, um, and, and and one of the other reliability things is uh, you you're just mentioning is that how do you ensure that the event doesn't disappear right so you can use something like a uh, you know uh, producer uh, producing the event or uh, in the blockchain producing the event and the consumer uh, who is interested in the event consumes that event processes that event successfully and then only acknowledge the acknowledges that event on the event broker so you can have this you know explicit acknowledgement cycle that way you you will ensure that your events are never lost at least you know once the events are there in the message broker they are never lost on the other hand you can also ensure uh, that you know while producing the event in the first place there are certain uh, you know message delivery sem semantics like uh, uh, just once delivery or you know at least once delivery like they are there in kafka or rabbit rabbit mq so you can ensure those kind of semantics are enabled for your system so that on the producer side the producer never misses the event to register them on the message broker and also on the consumer side the consumer consumes it and successfully processes it and you know they don't uh, you know lose it beforehand without you know processing it and then just abnormally crashing I hope that answers the question. Awesome. So I suppose uh, we are two minutes overdue. I'll just wait a minute more for any questions and then awesome thank you thank you everyone thanks for the present uh, thanks for attending uh, looking forward to more interactions have a great day